Uh, welcome everyone to today's uh, virtual panel discussion on firearm violence prevention, community violence intervention approaches. Uh, please note when you log in, your microphone and web camera are muted, but if you have any questions for our panel, uh, please submit those into the Q&A window uh, and we'll answer as many of those as possible. Uh, but at this time, Philip, I'll go ahead and turn the session over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Patrick. We're going to wait um, a few more minutes as folks are entering, um, but I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, we look forward to having uh, an engaged conversation. We'll get started. Welcome, everyone. My name is Philip Graham, and I'm a principal scientist in RTI's health practice area. I've been conducting community-based research for more than 25 years now, with research focusing on evaluating preventive interventions developed to reduce and prevent adolescent interpersonal violence, including several CVI-related projects. But today, I have the honor of being the moderator of this important webinar. So to get us started, I wanna give you a rundown of today's webinar. We're gonna start by hearing from our esteemed panelists, and I have some questions I'm going to ask them but I'm hoping it will feel more like a conversation and a discussion on CBI and less of a rigid Q&A. Following our panelist discussion, if I can keep them uh, to the minutes allotted, we're gonna leave some time for questions. And if you'd like to submit a question, I think as Patrick has already said, please put that in the Q&A. I know some of you have already submitted questions in advance, so I wanna thank you for those as well. And now let me take a few moments to introduce our panel for today. First, we have Mr. Troy Rogers. Troy is a director of public safety for the city of Chattanooga. He has more than 30 years of experience during which he has transformed the lives of countless individuals through his innovative approaches to building relationships and solving problems. He has run, and I'm gonna give you some examples. You'll really understand why we asked Troy to be a part of this webinar. He has run Chattanooga City Violence Reduction Initiative. He is a creator of the Reentry Playbook He's created the Juvenile Information Session, was a co-creator of the New Life Job Fair. He's come up with the 10 Commandments of Mentoring, and he's written multiple books related to crime and social economic issues. So uh, you're in for a treat today as Troy shares you the work he's actually been doing in Chattanooga. Next, we have Dr. Stacy Secrets. Stacy joined RTI International in 2022. She has dedicated most of her professional career to the study of interpersonal violence and crime violence reduction. Her work has included partnerships with law enforcement and other criminal justice agencies at the state, local, and federal levels to provide research and training and technical systems to help those jurisdictions better understand current violent crime dynamics and then to use data to develop and operationalize strategies to address violent crime and evaluate the impact of those strategies. And last but not least, we have Dr. Anna Yars. Anna is the director of the Mental Health Risk and Resilience Program here at RTI and has more than 12 years of experience conducting prevention and intervention research. She currently leads a CDC study with me on community violence in Milwaukee and has led several other CDC research firearm violence prevention efforts. Anna has substantive interest in risk and protective factors for a variety of mental health problems and youth risk behavior, such as aggression, violence, and suicide ideation. She's also led several research projects to evaluate school and community-based program, uh, prevention programming. So why are we here today? Hopefully to one, define what is CVI and discuss its impact on community violence, and also to better understand the relationship between law enforcement, community, and the systems serving, uh, serving those communities. So what is CVI? Unfortunately, there's currently no single definition of CVI creating a potential misalignment and misrepresentation of a field of practice that actually has been a lot, a, here a lot longer than people think, but it's just recently gained a lot more uh, public uh, interest and scrutiny. So I'm excited to say that there is a definition that was recently released by the CBI Action Plan. Uh, and so we're going to put that in the chat for you guys to take a look at. And so, and I'll tell you more about it, but the, the, the CBI Action Plan was shaped by conversations with over 300 leaders and practitioners across the CBI field and represents one of the most comprehensive and coordinated synthesis of what is needed to strengthen and support a CBI landscape today. 
This report was just recently uh, released and so should serve as a resource about where we wanna go as a field. So here's the definition that's provided in the CBI action plan. Again, it is one definition. Uh, I'm sure those on the, uh, on the call webinar today may have some slightly different uh, understandings of it, but this is what we'll use to frame our conversation today. So it goes as follows. CBI interventions is an approach that uses evidence-informed strategies to reduce near-term violence to tailored centered to tailored uh, community center in, uh, initiatives. These multidisciplinary strategies engage very high-risk individuals and groups to disrupt cycles of violence and retaliation. CBI workers establish relationships between individuals and community assets to deliver services that save lives, address trauma, and provide opportunities. And when executed along with other targeted wraparound services, CBI helps improve the physical, social, and economic conditions that drive violence. So that's the definition that we will use today. But to get us started, I'd like to first start with a question to Troy, um, and then we'll kind of proceed with the other panelists. So Troy, how did you get into community violence intervention, and can you explain your journey working with interrupters? Man, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I, I want to just, I want a, a common theme, and I want our common theme to be relationships, community, trust, and we got to have fun. And so for me, in 2016, I came, uh, I was working for the Burke administration. I was over the violence reduction initiative. And I came in day one wanting to find out the why behind crime. And when I began to talk to people, I began to see that we had a lot of broken individuals. And so we put a plan together um, um, day one. How can we build a robust community that can support the young people um, that we have? And so we've always tried to fill in the gaps in Chattanooga, and we've always tried to be there for people. But I understood right early on that nobody was born bad and that nobody was born to go to jail and nobody was born to hurt anybody. A lot of times in the community, our, our, our kids and the people that, that committed violent crimes were young people who had a lot of problems in their life. And so what happened is during my during my time, uh, I, I met a lot of guys. I call it returning talent. So I met a lot of guys who, Philip, who were who were guys who had been in jail, and I was trying to keep guys from going into jail. And so at the time, we had guys who came back uh, um, to Chattanooga from jail, and they wanted they wanted to get in their community, and they wanted to to, to help. They had stolen so much from the city, they wanted to give back. And so what we did is we began to have a reentry council with all guys that came. We had twenty guys over 244 years of incarceration. And we begin to ask them a question, Beth. We begin to say, what, what happened? And the guys told us that they had a traumatic event and they did not have anybody in their life to help them navigate. They did not have a trusted adult in their life to help them navigate. And that is what kept them out, got them in trouble. Mayor Burke goes out of office, and then you have then you have Mayor Kelly, and we begin to ask the question, Philip. How, you know, we got to get these guns off the street, and we begin to ask the question. And, and I realized that we could not tell people to take the firearms out of their hands unless we were ready to put something back in it. And a lot of times in our community, economics is the reason why a guy has a gun. We we would do programs and mentoring in schools, and I'll never forget being in the, being in the in the hallway one time. The guy got in trouble. He was selling some some narcotics, Philip, and he said, "I'm the one who take care of this family. I don't have a father, and I have to provide for my sister and my brother. I keep this gun on me for protection. I don't. I I feel safe when I have it. And so I said, "Oh my God, we have lost." lost our way. And so we began, uh, uh, like I said, we began to, to get into the schools and we wanted to block, we wanted to block the gangs. We wanted to block it. So we, we, we began to get in the school. And you you got to the about 11 or 12. If you don't get them, they mind. And I said, man, we got to do everything in our power to get in and save our youth. And so Kelly comes in and he brings in an office of community health. I, I was the uh, public safety office. They put me up under. They put me up under a uh, 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 mayor Kelly, and Mayor Kelly uh, opened up Office of Community Health, which birthed CBI and birthed the Chainbreakers. 
Stacy was able to meet the chain breakers. And so we 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 had a, a guy, and the organic thing about it was that I had I had worked with them post-incarceration. So the trust was already built. And so the chain breakers have a thing. They're 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 saying is we're breaking chains one link at a time. And if you come to our office, we say these two things: you we all we got, we all we need. We all we need, we all we got. And just because you came from a broken place, a broken place doesn't have to come from you. And so what we've done is we've created an atmosphere and a culture of love and growth because I understand that as, as I lead them, they're still dealing with their trauma as well. And so every Monday morning, Philip, we have a trauma-informed session for them because they're still dealing with the hurt of their past. And so we have discipled them and, I, and, and let them know that, yes, you are helping the community, but we're going to make sure that you have what you need. And if you have a problem, we're there for you. And so that's how we got into the that's how we got into to into the cha, into the chain breakers. And so and so in, in Chattanooga, when I came in, I wanted to look at it and I wanted to be very clear. See, Philip, I wanted to look at crime from a social economic lens. The lens of poverty was the first. And and Gandhi said that poverty is the worst form of violence. The was the lens of untreated mental illness, which untreated mental is a public health crisis that nobody talks about. Philip, the third one is fatherlessness. And this is what I'm seeing when I'm having a conversation with young people. There's no fathers in the building. And the third one, the fourth one, and our last one, I'm gonna be quiet for this question, is illiteracy. National uh, assessment of the early readers said 75% of young people who do not cannot read by the fourth grade have a 75% chance of going on welfare or being in jail. And so we put our time into trauma-informed care and love looking from a lens of socioeconomics. Thank you. No, no, per, no, that's perfect, Roy. So, Victoria, thank you for kind of getting our, our heads to spinning here. I, I'd like to follow up with a question and really kind of dig a little deeper. So also, can you, I know you mentioned the chain breaker, but can you talk about types of CVI program uh, that you and your team have implemented in Chattanooga and describe some of the impact of that programming uh, on the areas that you serve to date. Man, I sure will. Guys, you understand that anytime you do a CVI program, you have the birthing stage and then you have the stage where you got to get to work and you got to validize and, 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 and be credible. And so when our guys came in, I wanted to make sure that each of them were able to have a buy-in on what we're doing. And so what we did, Philip, is we looked at the data. We looked at the data and we saw that our, our highest crime rate right now is in zone three, which is in zip code 3744, 37406. And so we began programming in that area. And what we did is we programmed into violence. Any of my CVI people listening on there, when you see that where your numbers are high, you make sure that you program into violence so that there's always an alternative for a young person who may be wanting to, who may, who may be wanting to break into a car. And so on Monday, on Mondays, we do a thing called Real Talk Mondays. And that's ran by a couple of our guys who are who have been uh, gang affiliated. On Tuesdays, we do a thing called uh, Taco Tuesdays, where we feed, have real conversation, and we play basketball in the inner city. On Wednesday, we do think we do we do think some Stacy in in the in the Bayberry apartments, which is our most violent area, and we haven't had anything happen there since May twenty fourth. But we have a community meal and we have conversation, and we always average about seventy people there. And then on Thursdays, we do a basketball nights, and that's that's at Avondale Center, which everything is in our zone three. We are doing everything in zone three at the time when violence happens, and so we begin to do we begin to do those things. And we begin to see in our zone, we begin to see things drop. And so, and so we have a mission and we're and we're passionate about that, but we are very strategic about what we serve. And so we we also have a have a thing. Um uh so on so on Fridays, the guys are at nightfall. So they're working at nightfall, they're helping, they're they're learning, they're growing, and they're communicating with people. And, and so that they work in five days a week. So we're in a stage right now where we're trying to build credibility one and validity. So we want to be out there. It's a lot of work. It's early morning, long hours, but we want to establish credibility. And that's what we're doing. We also have something that's called a juvenile calling that I created a while back. And that's something where we bring in the people who have, we bring in the young people who have 
have a have a something on their record and they're going through the court system. And I want to I want to tell you something right now. This is what got me going really good in, in my career is that when I was sitting in a meeting one one time, my partner sent me a message and he said 97 percent. And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said 97 percent of the young people in this thing have an abuse allegation in their file. So what's that tell you, Philip? That tells you that suspects were victims first. So how do we continue to build a trauma-informed community? Everything that we do in Chattanooga is trauma-informed. And you guys know that the question is not more, not anymore, what did you do? But it's always what happened to you. I would I I, I have a, a thing that I used to do, and I realize I realized in a social economic autopsy that it was always uh, something that happened to our guys who would, would either get, get, get put in jail for a long time. Or, 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 or go to the grave. And so we begin to work with them in that way. And you begin to see your city leaders. Guys, you gotta have community. You gotta have your community lead leaders behind you. So you, you see the police chief, you see, the, you see the, the DA, you see the feds, everybody comes in and they let you know what laws are being changed and everything like that. But then you have a force of pain. A lady who has lost a loved one, and then you have, and then you have, then you have a voice of hope. I, I put my guys up there who are now, who are now giving their life to service, and so we want to build a community and, and an atmosphere of service and love. And when you see us, you got to know we're about that work and we're about helping you. And so, and so, and so, what we, what we, what we've been able to do is is is, is, is build a atmosphere and a coalition of help and love. And I tell people all the time, I want to get more of those guys who made the problems on this side of the table because it takes broken to get broken. A lot of times we think that you know you can go in there and not have anything wrong, but guys who've been there done that, you got to go get guys who've been there done that. I'm getting a little excited. Let me calm down. No, no, sounds good. No, no, sounds good. Okay. Before I switch over to this, can uh, we talked earlier about fist pump Fridays? Can you? Oh yeah, I was getting, explain? I was right, I was going to that, but you All right, go for it. <laughs> so fist bump Friday, fist bump Friday is is a thing. It's our zone school. Fist bump Friday is our zone school, and and they call say, hey man, we got some gang issues, man. We need some help. We need some men in the building. We need a program, and so we we did this thing called fist bump Fridays, where we bring in people who look just like them in their community who are doing tremendous things. So we bring in speakers, we have music, we let them dance, we feed. And one thing that, that, the, te that, that the teachers told us was that, was that, was that, there, with that on, on those Fridays, attendance was the highest as, as, as it ever been because they did not want to miss Fist Bump Friday. So we always use that time to build relationships and to, and to hang out with the guys who, who were at risk and trying from being on high risk. Thank you. Great. Now, thank thank you. And, and we'll be coming back to have other questions for you. Uh, I want to shift and Stacy um, just talk about partnerships. So part of our work at RTI is to create bridges between community partners and those doing on the ground work uh, and research. And, and Stacy has done this. And so I'd like for her to take some time. Can you explain uh, how you partner with the city of Chattanooga and Troy's team on CBI work? Absolutely. Um, thanks. And Troy, you're a tough act to follow. So lucky me. But anyway, we're, we're honored to have you on here, Troy. Um, but I'm with um, RTI's justice practice area. And I tell people all the time that the best part about my job is I get to meet so many amazing people doing incredible work and I get to learn from them and then hopefully be able to provide something back to them in return and sort in terms of help or resources through research, evaluation and training and technical assistance. Um, oftentimes the work that we do in one project informs others and we get to work with so many different communities across the country that it's really provided us with an understanding about how community violence and community violence interventions vary across communities. They oftentimes look very different, but they also have some similarities. They're oftentimes adapted to fit their local context as they should be. Oftentimes CVI programs are defined differently. And Philip, you hit on that, that definitions often vary in terms of what community violence intervention is. And we're also learning a lot about um, how CVI programs are supported. And by supported, I mean both financially 
and by the partners in the larger ecosystem in the communities in which their CBI programs are operating. And then sometimes we learn about how those programs are sometimes not as well supported as they should or could be. And again, these things all look very different across communities. So at RTI, you know, we are not only seeking to gather information and learn best or promising practices, but one of our, our main goals is to make sure that we're getting this information back out to the field. And so that often looks like individual outreach and relationships like Troy and I have built, or sometimes through dissemination methods such as this to reach larger audiences to, to be able to, to share the information and the, the knowledge that, that we've learned. So in meeting Troy, it was kind of an interesting story. Um, so we are evaluating the Project Safe Neighborhoods um, initiative at RTI, and we have 10 case study sites. And the Federal Judicial District in the Eastern District of Tennessee is one of those case study sites and Chattanooga is a focus of PSN for that district. And so as part of the case study, we're doing these site interviews with key personnel. And this is a largely law enforcement driven initi initiative with community engagement as a component. But most of these interviews are happening with prosecutors, with law enforcement officers, et cetera. And I kept hearing from everyone on these interviews, Troy Rogers, great work. The community violence intervention that's coming out of the mayor's office is incredible. Um, this has been really innovative and has been a really you know, pivotal uh, initiative to, to come into our community. So I said, you know, who is this Troy Rogers? Who is this Troy Rogers? So finally, I had a chance to actually meet with an interview with him. And you've seen him now. And so you get it. The passion, the energy, um, the will to do this work in very innovative ways is all there. And what was really surprising for me, because, again, we've been doing uh, work in communities across the country, is hearing from law enforcement specifically about how much they valued the CVI work that Troy is doing and how they value the relationship with Troy specifically. And that was just something different. And that was something that we'd not heard a lot about. So I said, there's gotta be some sort of magic here. So as we continued to talk with Chattanooga, uh, we learned that the Chattanooga Police Department also has a very good case clearance rate. And so we have a, a project called Project Clears here that's funded by Arnold Ventures uh, that, that we're leading. And that stands for Community, law enforcement alignment to resolve shootings. And as part of Project Clears, we're looking for law enforcement agencies who have very good case clearance rates for fatal and non-fatal shootings. Chattanooga Police Department fits that bill. And then we also learned through our interviews for PSN that the Chattanooga Police Department is very community engaged. And so a goal of Project Clears is for us to not only learn about effective investigative practices leading to those high clearance rates, but to also take a deep dive into how community-based organizations in each of those communities are active in gun violence prevention and response. And so, of course, in meeting Troy and understanding all the connections with the community there, it made sense that Chattanooga be a good site for Project Clears. So fast forward, um, Troy invited us to come as part of Project Clears um, and spend a couple of days with him and his team. They welcomed us with open arms. Uh, we got to see, uh, we got to sit down with the chain breakers, um, spend a couple hours just asking questions, um, understanding what their needs, challenges, and successes were, and they were very open in sharing that with us. Then we went out into the community, saw the Bayberry area that Troy mentioned where they're working. We saw a juvenile information session that evening. The next day we went to Fist Bump Friday, and it was all very um, illuminating in terms of the work that they're going on and really the collegial and supportive atmosphere, I feel like, that Troy's office has, has made for the CBI staff there. Um, one of the things that we learned about, though, during our, our visit was that the chain breakers had a bit of an uncertain uh, future about funding. So they had relied on some ARPA funds. Um, and I was aware through our work at RTI about DOJ's Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative, which started in FY22 and has poured millions and millions of dollars into CBIPI programs. So Troy and I started kind of tossing that idea around. Would the city of Chattanooga potentially be interested in applying for that? Um, if so, my RTI um, apply for a complimentary grant to do an evaluation of the work there. And so since we've applied for that funding and fingers crossed that hopefully we'll get it and we'll be able to continue to work together. 
Um, since then, Troy and I have continued to exchange information. And I really think that one of the greatest gifts is someone being willing to take a chance on you. And I feel like Troy did that. You know, he welcomed us as a research team in uh, to meet with him, to learn from their experiences, um, successes and challenges, which was really great. And we've continued to try to think through advancing CBI work together. Um, so we spent time, we built a relationship and today is a great example. Uh, Troy has a lot of work to do there in Chattanooga, but he was more than willing to take time to participate today. Um, and share his experiences. And he's also been available as I've learned from other sites through Project Clears or PSN about resource needs that they have. So he's been willing to reach out and kind of offer peer support uh, to some of those sites who have uh, questions about juvenile information sessions, for example. Um, so one thing I thought that I would kind of share for purposes of this conversation in our last few minutes here, are some of the common uh, themes and challenges that we're seeing uh, in CVI programs uh, that I've either worked with in Project Clears or in PSN. And I should say that in Project Clears, we're doing interviews with community-based organizations who are active in gun violence prevention and response. So we almost always talk with a CVI program if it's operational in the jurisdiction that we're working with. Um, so one thing that we've learned um, is that there is no one size fits all model for CVI. Uh, we've even heard from CVI programs that the definition of CVI can vary across communities and that the CVI programs themselves really feel like each community should be able to define CVI as it makes, makes most sense for them. Another thing that we're learning is that a lot of CVI programs are doing a lot of upstream prevention work. And Troy just described um, several activities I think that would fit that mold. And I think oftentimes the prevention and front end work that CVI programs may not be getting the attention or the notice. And so I love when Troy talks about, you know, programming to the data and he's really um, put in sort of proactive and preventative types of activities in the areas that are known to be at highest risk for violence. And so I think that's one thing Chattanooga is really doing well is using data to inform their strategy and their implementation of this program. We're also learning a lot about how law enforcement agencies perceive CVI programs and vice versa. And there's some real challenges there. And I think that there needs to be more education for law enforcement, especially at the front line, about CVI programs, how they operate, and particularly why they may not be able to share information directly with law enforcement. I think there's a lot of skepti skepticism that has grown out of lack of information or lack of education. And what that has led to is a certain amount of distrust. And I feel like with some education and just some efforts to build relationships, a lot of those challenges could be overcome. And again, Troy in Chattanooga is another great example of how he has worked specifically with the Chattanooga Police Department to overcome some of those challenges. So I think um, he's another great example in that area. Um, one other thing to mention is that DOJ's CVIPI funding is incredible. It's a great resource to have, but what we're hearing across a lot of communities is that programs who are operating um, or agencies who are operating CVI programs oftentimes don't have the capacity to write or to manage these large federal grants. And therefore they're not applying to them and they're not receiving the type of support that they could receive if they had that kind of, of support um, to be able to write and manage those grants. So are there ways that we can be helpful there? And then one last final thing is that data collection and data tracking is a challenge. All the CVI programs know they need it. They need to tell the story of their program and the impact. But you know, one of the key questions is what are the best measures of success that don't rely on us waiting to see what happens with violent crime reduction? Because that's oftentimes a more longer term impact. So what are the measures that we can be collecting now that maybe are more assets-based or strengths-based uh, that come out of the work that CVI programs are doing? And then how do you count some of these prevention activities as well that a lot of the CVI programs programs are actually implementing in addition to kind of that retaliatory violence intervention. So I think I'll stop there, but um, take it back yeah. over to you, Philip. Yeah, no, thanks, Stacey. That's great. Um, Stacey just mentioned uh, issues around measurement and success. We have just started a, a really innovative project with a couple of foundations to work with CVI researchers and practitioners in particular around this notion of 
what does success look like in the CBI context? And so we are just starting that work, but it's important that we are using measures that really are informed by those who deal with these issues day to day. And so we hope to be able to share that in the near future. I want to get back to this conversation and talk about the elephant in the room. This relationship between law enforcement and CBI, um, it, it's not easy. There's lots of tension there and for very good reasons. And so, Troy, you seem to have navigated some aspects of that. So I want to come back to you. And then I'm going to, after you speak, I'm going to go to Anna and talk about these systems that support the CBI work. So part of successful interrupting uh, can involve effective coordination with law enforcement. I think you may disagree, but I'd love to hear. So in your opinion, what leads to a successful relationship uh, with law enforcement, particularly in CBI work, but also speak to the challenges, the lessons learned uh, from your experience? You know, same thing, relationships, community, trust. The thing about me is I started my career, you know what I'm saying, working with law enforcement. And so you gotta have a strong person who the community trusts and law enforcement, law enforcement trust, because you hear law enforcement and you hear the community. And so I've been, the, I've tried to be a bridge um, between both of them. You cannot force our guys who have had, you know, been in prison and stuff like that. They have their own perception of law enforcement. But what I can do is I can organically do community events and invite them both and they'll be in the room and they begin to talk. So organically, we're building relationships. And what I've seen from, and, and from CPD, and I'm very appreciative of it, we had a situation on Glass Street, and, and what they did, Philip, is they they asked my guys to help them come up with a solution. And so and, and instead of them just saying, we're going to do this, no, guys, help us come up with a solution. And we were able to come up with, with a solution to get the street back safe. Nobody was hurt. And my guys felt good about that, you know, felt good about that. I meet with, um, you know, Sergeant uh, Hewitt, we meet, you know, we talk, man, hey, how can we get better? You know, so if there's an issue, it kind of goes up top. I'm kind of the buffer in, in, in for the chain breakers. You know, Chris is a buffer as well. You know, if, we, if, if it's something that well, our guys get out of line, they're going to let us know. And then we're going we're gonna to confront and, and, and get it together. And so I think the things that we can learn is that, man, you got to kind of know a person for who he is. And I, I, I'm there to validate for good men like Josh May, good men, good men like Greg Wilhelm, good men like like Nathan Vaughn, who are good men behind the uniform. And so I've, I've tried my best to let my guys know how how good these men are. And I let the law enforcement know how great these guys are who may have made a mistake, but now they're giving their life to the community. So I think every CVI has to have a person who has tough skin and who's not scared to have the tough conversations because they're going to happen. <laughs> because you're going to hear some stuff that you don't like and you're going to hear some stuff that you don't like. And people are going to assume and, 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 and assumptions can get you messed up. But we work nightfall with the police and they let us, they let us handle the fights. They let let us handle the disturbance. It's it's working together organically, and I think we got to continue to build. It didn't get this way overnight, and it won't change overnight. But we can organically to in our streets to say whatever we got to do to do that. I think is good. We could probably just go back and forth on this one for the rest of the time, but I, I want I want I want to do things one. I want uh, folks to hear from Dr. Yars. Also, want to make sure we've saved enough time to answer uh, all the questions in the Q and A. So, um, I'm going to hold some follow up questions, Troy, and hopefully, those of you who are listening may have additional questions about understanding that relationship between law enforcement uh, and CBI workers. So, I want to switch to Anna, uh, and Anna will talk about some work that she and I have been fortunate to do in Milwaukee, uh, but more specifically, I want to talk about these systems that really support this work. So, um, so Anna, an important factor in successful CBI is how the work is navigated through uh, these recent and significant increases in the offices of either violence prevention or well-being and safety. Can you speak to the value of community organizing and the integration of this kind of work in city systems who are in now focused on CBI work. A absolutely. So I um I really appreciate the conversation because what I've what I've heard um from Stacy and Troy again and again today, and we all sort of know it, but it's important to crystallize it and mention it is the word relationships. 
our relationships that we build are essential to making an impact, to connecting with individuals in communities to actually change the way that our communities work. So um, this, you know, I think has been on the forefront of many, many communities' minds. And so we have seen this shift along with changes at the federal level but and the state levels, but shifts in local communities to develop and set up these offices of violence prevention. And sometimes they're in health and human services. For us, we started with a project partnering with Milwaukee where the Office of Violence Prevention was based out of the Department of Health. And that's because taking a public health approach to violence prevention is really starting to to be where a lot of the evidence supports prevention programming. Um, so in Milwaukee, before we even got involved in 2020 through our CDC R01 project um, called the ACER project, Milwaukee was jumping off and creating this Office of Violence Prevention in 2016 that really focused on building these relationships. So not just in the community, although that was essential, they were able to hire a fantastic and community engaged violence preventionist, Reggie Moore, who already had those community connections and was able to sort of crystallize the, the um, relationships and bring them to the city level. So then the mayor got involved, the chief of police got involved, all sorts of folks in the infrastructure were critical um, not just to be involved and to have a say and to be at the table, but to stay at the table. And so they created what they call the Blueprint for Peace in Milwaukee. And that was actually a process of sitting at a table for months to figure out what does this community need based on data and what community members are willing to bring to the table for their own buy-in for violence prevention. And so community organizing became a huge part of that. Community organizing is, is really the recognition that the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences that Troy was talking about, the trauma-informed lens, happen not just at the individual level, but at the community level. These communities, Philip, Philip created a, a map of Milwaukee's violence communities and overlaid the redlining map right on top of it. These are communities that have trauma histories. They have significant history of a variety of economic, social, and um, in some ways emotional trauma. Um, and so building organizing at the community level starts with helping community members and the city understand that understand the history, understand how it impacts the average community member, and then understand how we work together and build those relationships towards functioning prevention techniques. I, I was really struck, Troy, by what you said about if we take a firearm out of someone's hands, we have to put something else back in their hands. They're using that tool. That is a tool for them for protection for a variety of different things. Could be a tool for them for economic gain. It's a variety of different reasons that someone's carrying a firearm. And what do we need to do to figure out that um, response? And the value of the community is figuring out what in that community they can put in that person's hands. Now we work, for instance, and, and I had to jump in and respond to Becky's excellent questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Becky, for adding questions to the Q&A. We work with a rural community in Ashe County, North Carolina. Ashe County, uh, unfortunately, has a really high suicide rate. The use of firearms and the carrying of firearms in Ashe County, very, very rural community in Appalachia, is very different from Milwaukee. And so what we put in people's hands in Appalachia and in Ashe County, North Carolina, is really different from the violence prevention that's happening in Milwaukee. And that's why you have to have this ground up approach of incorporating what the community needs, not just in terms of their needs, but what they need and what will function as an effective response. Thank you, Anna. And we are doing great on time. I, I do have a set of what's next step question for the panelists. But I'm going to hold those because I, I want uh, to start going through some of the questions we receive in advance of the webinar, as well as some that have come today. And, and so the first one is around resources and support. Um, and 
Troy and, and Stacy, um, I'd love for you guys to chime in here. What types of support or resources and training are provided to violence uh, interrupters uh, in Chattanooga or Stacy, where you may have learned in some of your other um, CBI adjacent work? So for me, um, every Monday, uh, we have trauma-informed care for them. Because like I said, they're still healing from their trauma, doing prison time, being in solitary confinement for years and years and years, father not doing what he's supposed to do. And so we do that every Monday. I also got them trained um, narrative for, for storytelling. And I never really understood like telling their story is so healing. It's so healing for those guys. And sometimes we have another guy tell another guy's story and it's so healing and reflective for them. And so also, you know, mentorship, you know, one thing that I do, you know, I walk with those guys, man, you know, my phone is never off. You know, I'm a, I'm a father to them guys. You know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big brother at times, you know, cause I'm the one that has to deliver the hard conversations a lot of times. And so we, we are very, very, uh, um, Cause we work really hard and I work the, I work them to death sometimes, you know, but, but we make sure that those guys are able to take care of their family, go see their kids, take their time off when they need, when they need to. Um, but the trauma informed care that we do every week is really good. We did something a couple of weeks ago on professionalism, just letting them know, keep your, you need to keep two feet in the good lane and not get one out. And I know sometimes money can be an issue and you want to kind of go back to the way you were. No, we need you to stay because one bad slip would shut down the whole program. And so, you know, the discipleship, I take them to meet people. I think one thing that we don't do enough of as leaders is get our guys in front of people. I network my guys. I leverage every relationship that I've ever had so that they can be validated and meet other people that they may not have met who can add value to them. And so we talk a lot about adding value and, 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 and a lot of encouragement. And so that is what we do to support to support our guys. My guys can come to me if they got an issue. Something ain't going right. They can come to me because we talk every single day. And I, I realize, I know what I need to do as a leader is I need to leave them better, you know, than I found them. So when, that when I move on, those guys will be able to move forward. Uh, Stacey, I don't know if there are any related um, uh, resources, training that's come up in some of your work and share. And then I have a, a, an issue about hard reach populations for Troy. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that we hear a lot about is the demands and stressors associated with CVI work. And so there's been a big push. Um, so Troy's example of making sure that there are trauma-informed approaches to support the workforce is important, but also the idea of stressors around pay benefits and really professionalizing uh, the role of the violence interrupter, the street outreach worker, et cetera, so that they can live comfortably and not have to worry about, for example, working two jobs to make ends meet. There was a really interesting study uh, that, was that was presented at the last NIJ CVIPI or DOJ CVIPI conference that talked about the stressors that CVI workers were encountering. And so really thinking through that it's more than just, um, you know, sometimes reliving secondary trauma. There's also economic pressures. There's fears or concerns about not being able to take a day off because someone's life might be at danger. So really making sure that whoever is administering or overseeing the CVI program and providing that support is understanding of these stressors and taking stock frequently uh, with the individuals who are part of their staff. And I think this is especially important as we're starting to see in some communities, and Troy, yours is no exception, that where CVI is showing an impact and is proving to be very valuable, there is more demand. So for example, in Chattanooga, Troy talked about zone three, but the mayor, I understand, wants the CVI work to actually expand to downtown, for example. So how are you going to do that in a way that still takes care of the staff so that you're not spreading them too thin, where now you're asking them to move into other areas of the city to do the good work that they do? Um, and then one last thing I think um, that we're hearing about is that the outreach workers are often encountering a lot of different types of issues. Um, so they're wearing a lot of hats when they're going out and doing their work. And so, you know, if they're encountering um, intimate partner violence or domestic violence, making sure that they have skills necessary to, to intervene and address some of those nuances. 
um, issues around um, firearm safe storage. So this idea that um, while we want people to not carry firearms, the reality is that a lot are for protection or for other reasons. And so is there a role for CVI programs to play around safe storage, for example, in teaching people um, how to store firearms safely? Um, so I think that there's a lot of challenges and there's a lot of support needed. And I think that the field has a lot of questions or, 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 or answers that, that can still be formulated. But um, those will be a few, few thoughts that I have. Thank you. Um, one of the early definitions of CBI is around a focus on those most at risk, uh, who often can be the hardest to reach. So we did receive a question that goes as following. What can organizations do to be more hyper-focused on the 1% of the population who is driving 60 to 70% of the violence? And so, Troy, let you speak to uh, how you engage that most high-risk population um, and, 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 and where that's a challenge. And how we have to think about if CBI is really going to, some CBI strategies that are you know, more near-term in terms of retaliation, what that looks like and what are the things that folks need to think about when engaging that most high-risk most high -risk population. Well, the, 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 a lot of times the high, high risk, man, they're hiding. You ain't going to be able to find them, but you can't, you, uh, uh, sometimes you can't meet guys that are doing, doing some stuff. I know that my guys, see, I got, I got gang members on my staff. So that's the blessing. And so, and so I know when things are going on and I can tell them, Hey, I need you to talk to so-and-so and so-and-so in Chattanooga, July 4th is a really, really, really violent month. And I said, Hey, you know, working where I work, I understand, hey, man, I need you to talk to, to you know who. And so a lot of times my guys will go behind the scenes and they'll have those tough conversations with they know guys that can that can pull the lever. You know, this high risk and at risk thing, this is something that we got to massage because a lot of times the, the high, high risk guys, they're not wanting to be found because a lot of times somebody's looking for them. And so you got to just be really careful. You got to make sure that, that you protect your staff. I don't want none of my guys getting killed. Uh, none of my guys, uh, you know, getting hurt in a, in a situation that's kind of out of out of our league. And so, you know, that is something that we just got to continue to, you know, that's why we do so much stuff. As we're out, hopefully somebody will pull them aside. A lot of times I get texts, you know, I get a message to meet somewhere, and, you know, and then and then we kind of can 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 work with the people. But those high risk guys, those one percent guys, you know, they're either a lot of times running from something, or man, they're scared for their life. So it, it just depends uh, on that. So that's something we got to keep working on in CVI because you know a lot of times you run past the guys who are like help, and you running you running towards the guys who running from you. And so we got to look at our resources and see the benefit of 25 guys who say, Hey, I want help. And then the one guy say, man, listen, leave me alone. And so it, we got to continue to work that and massage that around. And, you know, and, and again, this, this is one of the aspects of CBI work that there's been lots of conversation around and the challenges of that, right. Where funders will fund the 25, but won't fund the one. Right. And so, who's driving violence and how we figure that out. So thank you. Um, want to stay with you, uh, but again, uh, others may have thoughts about this. Anna, and Anna's a clinical psychologist and deals with trauma-informed approaches as well. We have the following question. Addressing trauma experienced by crime victims is an important function of CVI programs. Do Chattanooga CVI programs support victims directly or do they partner with serving organizations? And supporting organizations by supporting victims, I do not mean only working with victims that report their harm to law enforcement. I mean providing services that support victims' healing. Yeah, we have a victim services arm. You know, we have people who do victim services. You know, we also work with with CPD. Um, they have a they have a, a a very robust victim services unit. And yeah, that is that is that is what we do, man. We we work with people who are hurt, and we get emails all the time about people who may have had their house shot up and need help or services. You know, we have a a witness support fund. So for people who want to do the right thing, we're able to help them. We have a big small stuff fund, Stacy for 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 guys and girls. Who, who may be struggling and need just a hand up. You know, we do have an SOP with both of those things, but we all, we have a lot of resources 
for our people who want to to get we call it mental wellness and so a lot of times people may not want to go actually talk to somebody but they will they will build a strong relationship with which one of the violence interrupters or our or our victim services people and so like i said our whole thing is birthed on relationships relationships are the new form of currency i got a lot of degrees but this this relationship piece it is pay, it is paid more benefit than anything that i've ever studied and so and so we've been able to buy our relationships by the guys you know with their validity in our community be able to help a lot of people okay and, and i think the second part of that question and i think you described the services and this is a tough one and please chime in uh, I, I think there's something else that the the question was trying to get at when it says i mean providing services that support a victim's healing uh and so and if you could talk about ways in which you are directly addressing healing beyond the services that often come through victim services sure great great question I think there there are many forms of healing. Obviously, everyone is is different. I think just having the infrastructure that Troy's been talking about about being able to connect with someone who is like you, who has been in your position, who gets it, um, and think about another way and another way of devoting your life, as Troy's folks are to to prevention, is one form of healing. I think there's also obviously, as, as Troy has also mentioned, a huge need for, for mental health services. And, and some of that does come through victims, victim services sometimes. Some of that comes through um, a variety of other, you know, community organizations. So you, Troy mentioned, you know, the Fist Bump Fridays. Schools, schools provide an important role, especially for kids who are not necessarily victims, but witnesses to violence. Um, an important role in, in providing, you know, basic counseling, but also more and more actual uh, cognitive behavioral trauma informed therapies in the schools. Um, and then in other, you know, communities, I think it's, it's a call for action. We need more. We need more access to mental health care. We need more access to affordable mental health care. Um, we work on a project with um, with NIJ for victims of crime in North Carolina that has employed telehealth as a, as a beneficial way of connecting. This is Spanish speakers, for instance, with other Spanish speakers who can counsel them. And then, you know, Philip, your question reminded me of, of our paper that we did um, related to nurturing environments. So all the healing um, that that one can ha can do in in a therapy session or in a session with someone like a clergy member or someone who gets them all that is important but that doesn't have the staying power if you're going back to a dangerous environment so our environments have to become more nurturing have to become more um, trauma-informed so understanding just Things in their community, even if it's the built environment, you know, like greening spaces and things like that, those play a role in healing. Um, but continuing to think about upstream prevention, you know, how do we prevent, you know, your kid from not, you know, making the same mistakes you did, those kinds of things in and of themselves also provide healing. Thank you. I have one question before I have a panel wrap up. And Troy, you mentioned before um, uh, data and hotspots. So there's a question around here, one minute or less. What data did you collect to know where to begin? Well, I just looked at it. I looked at I looked at where the crime was highest. And so the area that was highest for us is our is our area where where the poverty is most, where our area was a food desert. It's no it's nowhere for nobody to get prescriptions. Our schools are the worst, are the worst. And so we looked in the area and we saw where the crime was. We saw where the times were. And so 1700 to 1900. Okay, we know, okay, we're going to be doing something in that area at that time. So we just crime, we just program into violence where it's high. Where, where it's highest, we're in there doing something. We're feeding, we're around that barbecue and we're walking, we're, we're doing something into violence. And, and, and I wanna give some data out because I do have some. And, and, so, and so right now from the things that we've done, our gang member homicides right now are down negative 67. Our non-fatal shootings are down 17%. Our gang member non-fatal shootings are down 19%. And what we did is from January to April 29th, we had 4,963 touches of impact. And I think moving forward, 
you got we've got to figure out how to communicate impact that is something that a lot of cities are struggling with how do you communicate impact is it is it your non-fatal shooting is going to be down is it you just want your homicides down but well, we got to simplify it so that we can go all streams ahead and, and take care of what we need to take care of thank you and, and thank you troy anna and i and i'm working in milwaukee have been trying to phrase what community touch looks like. And so I think that's right, touches of impact. Understanding that, yes, you have formal programming, but interaction with individuals in these communities are valuable pieces of information that need to be collected at that one. We have five minutes. And so I wanna thank our panelists today, uh, my colleagues for sharing. And so uh, in one minute or less, here's my final question for each of you. Uh, as it relates to CBI work across the country, where should we go from here? Or what recommendations might you make to anyone looking to launch or enhance their CBI work? Uh, I'm going to start with Stacy, uh, then Anna, and then Troy. You get to take us home. All right, thanks, Philip. Um, so, as a researcher, I, I would start there. So, the good thing is that with the CBI PI funding that DOJ has made available, they have asked that programmatic sites applying for CVI funding have a local research partner. So there will be a lot of research information, I believe, forthcoming uh, through that initiative and others that fall under the CVI PI category. So we're going to need to comb through that data to understand what's work, what works, what's effective for implementation and sustainability, what works for identification of individuals who are at the highest risk, which was your question earlier, Philip. So what is the best way to identify? What's the best way to engage them? what resources or supports are needed and which are most helpful, and then how can CVI programs and communities go about building their ecosystem and support network of partner agencies to address the underlying or root causes of violence. So I think really combing through that research, which I really believe will be forthcoming, is a great first step. And then being able to, like Troy said, translate that research into um, actionable information uh, for programs and sites and communities to use. Thank you. Anna. Great question. I, I definitely think we have to pull out in this one the, the three-legged stool. So we have to think about exactly what um, Stacy is saying. Where are we getting evidence and information about what works? And then how are we getting that back into the community? We're getting evidence about what works from our research. And the more and more that that's funded, I think that's a great step in the right direction. We're getting information about um, through listening, listening to our community members and hearing what has worked in the past and what could work in the future. And then we're getting information by trying when we actually try these programs, how exactly what Troy was describing, what are the metrics that are giving us information about what's working and what's not working and how it's working. So not just working on homicides, but working on all those upstream elements so we need to test those and we need to intervene even further upstream than we do now. And Troy. When I when I came to the city, when I came to the city, I had a I had a plan in place, man. I had a quadrant. I did all this. So I came up with a tier system. And the tier system is just to make sure that we triage our families. For me, it was the young guys. And so I think for cities, man, you gotta have a tier system. You gotta know your tier one guys. Your tier one guys are guys who have some low risk. You know, these are guys that they just need a little network and they'll be okay. Your two tier guys are maybe guys who don't have a job, maybe struggling, they have a house, but they just need a hand up and more mentoring. And your tier three guys are your guys who are homeless, your guys who have dealt with mental, mental, mental illness. And these are your guys that are in gangs and who are really frequent flyers in the criminal justice system. And so I said that to say that we have to have a solid plan and know where we're going. And we have to, it's going to take time. I've been in this field for a long time and I, and, and it's going be here when I'm gone. And so we have to, funders have to understand that this did not happen overnight and it will not stop overnight. Let's put the best people and let's let's come up with some guidelines that will really help people. And you better have the pulse of that community because you said it earlier, every community is different. We're not like Chicago. Chattanooga is a different entity and we have to do the best for Chattanooga. We can't be like somebody else. So you have to have people in the room who are very passionate about this work, who care about it, and, 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 and who are committed to see things happen. And I think with Chris and De Ms. Deborah and the team that we have, I, I think we have a, a tremendous team of people who love community. I wanna restate something that Troy uh, just said. 
Uh, CBI work is not new. Uh, it has now received lots of public interest, um, but I, I wanna make sure that particularly we at RTI realize that we wanna partner with folks and we don't consider ourselves the experts because um, others of you have been working in this space far and much longer. We wanna bring our resources, our expertise to make that work better and stronger. And so I wanna thank my colleagues today. Um, and while Troy doesn't work at RTI, I consider him a colleague in this space, in this field. Uh, and we wanna thank you for all for listening today. Hopefully you've been able to learn something. Uh, what's important here is about developing partnerships. This work is important. It needs continued resources. And we hope we've shed some light on that. And so on behalf of RTI uh, and my colleagues there, I want to thank you for joining us. And we look forward to future engagements. Enjoy the rest of your day and take care.